please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. That will be the main text for today's message. I mentioned I was going to preach today about losing weight. I'm preaching about losing the weight of sin. I want to preach about conquering the sin in our lives, by which sin I mean what Paul calls the besetting sin, or perhaps even the addictions that even truly born again Christians can and do struggle with sometimes. This is a topic that uh, I have preached on many times, and that really needs to be re-preached every now and then, as we all need to be reminded of these truths. By the way, that's actually what Paul told Timothy to do uh, in both of his letters to Timothy, to remind the church uh, that he was serving there of the things that Paul had taught when he was there. And Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, told Timothy to put the brethren in remembrance of these things, if thou shalt put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, he said. In 2 Timothy 2, 14, he said, Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. We, as Christians, have somewhat convenient, uh, selfish ways, perhaps, of forgetting the things that we hear and uh, read in, the, in God's Word, and of sometimes giving ourselves over to the flesh and the daily struggles that we do face. And so we do need to be reminded of these things now and then as we really need revival in our own lives and our commitment to serve the Lord and to crucify the flesh and to walk in the Spirit instead. As Paul said in Romans chapter 8, verse 13, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And we're supposed to, mortify means put to death, crucify. We are to put to death this body and live for, for Jesus. Amen. So in coming to Hebrews chapter 12, the writer, which I've said many times, I believe is Paul, has just listed actually several examples of uh, the heroes of faith of the Old Testament in chapter 11, who through faith, Paul says, subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, Stop the mouths of lions. Verse 34, quench the violence of fire. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong. Waxed uh, valiant, not, not violent, valiant in fight. Turned to flight the armies of the aliens. And then in chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, we're surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses. This, by the way, is not to say that those heroes of faith are now in heaven looking down on us, watching and observing uh, our actions. But actually that the scriptural records of their testimony stand as examples to us of how we are also to live by faith and to gain victory in our own lives. And so then he says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And the sin which doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Verse 3, for consider him, Jesus, that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. He said, remember what Jesus went through if you think you're going through a hard time. Today's message is about losing weight, not as in going on a diet or going to the gym or riding a bike to burn off excess fat that may hinder us physically, but it's about losing the heavy weight of sin that the writer here acknowledges does so easily beset us. It holds us back and keeps us from running the spiritual race that is before us that hinders some from being able to serve the Lord in the way that they want to or in the way the Lord wants them to. The writer here is directing this exhortation not to the unsaved, not to human beings in general, but solely and exclusively to Christians. Further, he's not uh, singling out or uh, directing this exhortation just to carnal Christians who are failing to walk in the Spirit. This is directed to all Christians. Paul says, let us, 
rather than you or ye, he's including himself in this exhortation. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience. That means willing endurance of the race that is set before us. In this context, that's willing endurance actually of God's uh, chastisement we see in the rest of this chapter. And this is to all Christians. I don't care how spiritual any self-described super saint thinks he may be. All Christians, all those who are truly born again, who have the gift of the Holy Spirit, and who have become partakers of the divine nature, as Peter says in Second Peter 2.14, do still battle the flesh. Some truly saved Christians still struggle actually with addictions that they know they are to repent of and lay aside, but they find themselves or perhaps think themselves powerless to do so. And they shouldn't think that because we're not powerless. The purpose for this message was to remind us that the Lord not only calls us to repent of all known sin in our life, but he also disapproves of and will not allow us to hold on to our sin. But the good news also is that he will empower us to conquer it. None of us can conquer sin in the flesh. None of us can do that. We cannot look within ourselves uh, for any strength to get the victory. Just like the heroes of faith and throughout chapter 11 here. We must have faith to believe that God will perform His Word. That He will empower us to do His will, whatever that may be. None of us can conquer sin by walking in the flesh, by looking to ourselves. That's exactly why Paul said in Romans chapter 7, For I know that in, that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. He said, For to will is present within me, but how to perform that which uh, is good, I find not. So I know how to desire you, but I can't find, do it myself. He said, for the good that I would, the good that I want to do, I do not. But the evil which I would not do, that I do. Paul says, I find myself doing the evil I don't want to do and not being able to do the things that I should do. And he's not talking here about the man who has not yet come to Christ. He's talking about himself as a born-again, radically saved Christian. How do we know that? We know that from verse 22 of Romans chapter 7. He said, For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. And by the way, no unsaved, unregenerate sinner uh, delights in the law of God after the inward man. He's saying even that after regeneration, we still must wage this warfare against sin. He said, Though I delight in the law of God after the inward man, I see another law in my members. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Then he says, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But praise God, then Paul says in verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, because he gives us the victory. Some Christians fall back into former practices and get entangled in them all over again. Some in addictions that, or sins that they foolishly resign themselves to. Some carnal Christians even are failing to believe that what they are doing is sin. Some Christian men give themselves over to sexual lust and pornography. Others to alcohol or to tobacco. Some even foolishly convincing themselves that such practices are acceptable for Christians to fall prey to and they resign themselves to it. Foolish. The only way for us to get victory over the weight of sin that holds us back, that besets us, is given in the very next verse in Hebrews 12, verse 2. The only way to conquer sin and addictions is by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I know by my own experience, that Christians can and do backslide or fall back into sins that they were gloriously delivered from when they were first saved. That happened to me. Actually, about 17 years ago, when for a brief time, I fell back into an addiction of smoking cigarettes, an addiction I actually formally bore from, I started smoking at the age of 14. And uh, I was addicted, you know, by the age of 15, and I didn't quit until I got saved when I was like late 20s. Uh, 
that happened to me. I fell back into an addiction of smoking cigarettes using a traumatic experience that we'd gone through as a family, uh, actually at a Hiles Light church we were in. Using that as an excuse, I fell back into smoking again, and in no time at all, I was hooked, uh, addicted all over again. And I was miserable in that sin. But once again, the Lord gloriously, faithfully, and mercifully delivered me out of my backsliding and taught me some things through that, led me some, to some scriptures through that. And so I'm going to repeat and remind us today of some practical steps that we can and really must take in order to lay aside the weight of sin that we struggle with, and even to conquer addictions that some have been taken captive by. But we do need to constantly remind ourselves of these things and remain constantly vigilant day, day by day in our struggle against sin. Christians are not to lose heart or to resign themselves over to any sin. Because even for backsliders, as we read in Jeremiah chapter 3, the Lord can heal your backsliding. One of the one of the scriptures the Lord led me to when I backslid was Jeremiah chapter 3. We're reading verse 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the south and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord. I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and will not keep anger forever. Verse 13, he said, Only acknowledge thine iniquity. Amen. Acknowledge thine iniquity, that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God. And have scattered thy ways to the strangers ever under every green tree. You have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. God said to Israel, Turn, ye backsliding children, O Israel. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. He said, For I am married unto you. That's God's heart. Verse 22, he said, Return, ye backsliding children. And he said, And I will heal your backslidings. I've got that verse underlined and highlighted in my Bible. I will heal your backslidings, Jeremiah 3.22. And then uh, Jeremiah responds, Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. God can and will heal our backsliding and deliver us from sin. But we need to start by taking some practical steps. So I want to talk about some practical steps we can take. And first of all, uh, we need to recognize that we have been called to holiness. Number one, recognize that you have been called to holiness. In other words, do not surrender to any sin. Right here in Hebrews chapter 12, after exhorting us to lay aside our sin and admonishing us in the following following verses there uh, to accept and to endure uh, the chastening that may accompany that sin. Paul then says in verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Every Christian is called to lose the weight of sin and to pursue holiness. Meaning, by holiness, I mean total and complete separation from all sin. That's what we are to pursue. Holiness. That's to be our our daily goal, our aspiration. The exhortation here is not just for super saints. And by the way, there are no super saints. There are none. We all struggle with sin. We are all still called to pursue holiness, uh, without which no man shall see the Lord. Turn to Romans chapter 12. Recognize and realize that you have been called to a life of holiness. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 7, For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. We are commanded to be purposed and determined to seek after holiness. To consciously decide to be holy. To walk worthy of our calling. As Paul says in Ephesians 4, to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. That's what we're supposed to do. Walk worthy of our calling. Paul says in Romans 12, verse 1 to 2, I beseech you, brethren, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, It is reasonable for God to expect us to put ourselves on the altar as a living sacrifice. That's reasonable. Why? Because he's he's surrendered his life for us. He has a right to expect that. That's reasonable for him to expect us to surrender our desires and our wills to his will instead. He says, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed 
by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As Christians, we must renew our minds on a daily basis. We do that primarily in two ways. First of all, by saturating our minds on a daily basis with the Word of God. Critical that we do that. If you're trying to get out of some sin, the victory is in the Word of God. And then secondly, by taking all evil thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. We're going to come back to those steps. First of all, recognize that you've been called to holiness. The Lord Jesus has called you to be holy and expects you to walk in that calling. Me too. And that leads to step two that's intimately connected with that, which is, number two, repent of your sin. Repent. Acknowledge that you have wrongly surrendered to some sin and repent of it. Acknowledge that, that God will not allow you to stay in that. As I just read in Jeremiah chapter 3, Only acknowledge thine iniquity, for thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God, and that you have not obeyed my voice. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, 4 through 5, to the church at Ephesus, a church that it was in many ways abiding faithful to him, serving him, making disciples and reproving heretics. But Jesus said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou, because thou hast left thy first love. And he said, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, he said, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. In the same way, Christ calls us to repent of all known sin in our lives. Acknowledge that you have wrongly surrendered to some sin, and repent. Turn to First John chapter 3. I need to make this point. That is that a Christian who is living in sin, who knows he is in sin, and who does not grieve over his sin, may well not be a Christian. I've covered this before several times, actually, but it fits into this message as well. That, in effect, is what John is saying here in 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 6, where John says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Then John says in in verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. That's a hard verse. For his, his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither is he that loveth not his brother. This is very strong language here. In fact, it was this very passage uh, and this language that initially brought me to the cross to salvation almost 32 years ago now. I read this scripture and I said, if this is true, I've been lied to. I must not be saved. My being raised in a Christian home, being baptized when I was nine years old, uh, didn't save me. I'm not, and I, up until then, I thought I was saved. I could pretty much live it up. That was what I, that was the way I believed. And, uh, I, I sinned all the time. Especially in my late teens and early twenties, thinking I was actually saved. With almost no conscience whatsoever. Thinking I was saved the whole time. To set the record straight, John is not Contradicting himself here, he says in 1 John 1 verse 8, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. John knows that we sin. There's no contradiction here. John's point in 1 John chapter 3, and saying, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. His point is that a born again child of God cannot sin because God will not allow him to. God will not allow him to. He'll, he will convict that man by his Holy Spirit and will make him miserable in his sin. That's what he means by because he, his, seed, his seed remaineth in him. The Holy Ghost is in him convicting him of his sin. And I say this partly from experience because that's really part of the new nature I got when I was born again. I hate, got a hatred of sin. And when I'm in sin, I make, I'm miserable about it. But I also say that because I do believe that this is the best way to interpret this passage in light of the overall message of the New Covenant. So I do believe that a professing Christian who will not acknowledge his sin 
who is living in sin and does not grieve over his sin is probably, in fact, not a Christian at all. If you have sin in your life, do not ever resign yourself to it. Repent, recognize it as sin, and as a sin that God wants out of your life. Don't ever make the mistake of thinking that because God has been merciful to you, and he's been gracious, that perhaps he condones your sin or will allow you to remain in it. Paul says, lay aside, the Bible says, lay aside every weight, every weight, and the sin which just so easily beset you. And different Christians have different besetting sins, I believe. Run with patience, he says, a willing, that's willing endurance of God's chastening, the race is set before you. Many Christians make the huge mistake of thinking that their particular vice or addiction is not sin. And actually, in one area, due to very faulty mishandling of the Scriptures, many Christians believe God condones and has no problem with their consumption of alcohol. Some pseudo-Christian make-believers think they can pretend to be spiritual while ignoring the fact that they are addicted to alcohol, completely ignoring Paul's warning that no drunkard can inherit the kingdom of heaven in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Turn to Romans chapter 14. I would warn all Christians to be very careful with what you call Christian liberty. Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Peter also says in 1 Peter 2.16 that we are to live, quote, as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness. Or any other sin, by the way, but as a servant of God. And I believe that far too many Christians justify gratifying their flesh by using the cloak of Christian liberty, as Peter calls it. As Paul says, using liberty for an occasion of the flesh. Many do so very selfishly, never considering how they may have become a stumbling block to others in the process. And that's why Paul also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a, become a stumbling block to them that are weak. The entire 14th chapter of Romans um, is devoted to this subject of Christian liberty, which Paul concludes as we read in verse 21 to 22, uh, It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. He says, verse 22, Hast thou faith? Have to thyself before God. Very important verse here. Underline this. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Very important statement there. As for the subject of alcohol, I am very well, of all the Bible verses cited to promote the idea uh the supposed idea that uh, Christians are at liberty to consume alcohol. Lord willing, uh, I'll have an entire message on this subject of alcohol and the Christian next week. Today I will say this about this subject. Those who say it's okay to drink alcohol in moderation are in a, a tenuous position of having to decide for themselves what degree of moderation is acceptable. Since there really is no definition of such in the Bible. Of course, they say, yes, there is. I can drink alcohol as long as I don't get drunk. That's what they say. But one problem is that is uh, that all the Ill, that the ill effects of alcohol on the body and on the brain begin to materialize actually long before drinkers have a sensation of drunkenness or will admit that they're being affected. Another problem they have is that the Bible nowhere says Christians are free to consume alcohol in moderation. And in fact, plainly teaches that Christians should avoid alcoholic drinks altogether. Amen. Proverbs 6, verse 27 says, Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? The proverb has the sin of adultery directly in view there, but the principle of that proverb uh, applies to alcohol just as easily as it does uh, to the horse woman in the context there. Alcohol is a deadly poison and a raging fire. And I repeat today, as I've always stated, from my first days pastoring this church, that where alcohol is concerned, if you play with fire, you will get burned. The Bible says in Proverbs 20, verse 1, 
Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The deception of alcohol. It says but whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. The deception is the false notion that you can drink and not be ill-affected by it, or that you can drink and your family won't be ill-affected by it, or that you can drink it occasionally and not become addicted to it. It's playing with fire. We read in Leviticus chapter 10 that priests ministering before the Lord were not to touch a drop of wine. In Numbers chapter 6, we read that of the other Israelites who wanted to consecrate themselves to the Lord were also not to touch a drop of wine during the time of their consecration. And I believe that is the model for the Christian. We are to be consecrated to the Lord. And if you want to serve God and be consecrated to Him, that is a good standard. Never touch a drop. Beyond that, as also stated multiple times on this topic, as for alcohol, get this down straight. I've always said this. What the fathers condone in moderation, the children will consume in excess. Why is that? It's because children, uh, because foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And what the fathers condone in moderation, the children will consume in excess. And that really is how fathers in particular can be a great stumbling block to their own children in condoning the consumption of alcohol to any degree. There really is a, a great misconception among Christians as to the Bible's warnings against alcohol. And I should have covered this a long time ago. I'm sorry I didn't. I'm going to next week, Lord willing. I plan to show you that most, if not much, if not most of the time that we read the word wine in the Bible, it does refer to non-alcoholic wine, simply meaning grape juice. And that clearly includes, by the way, the wine that Jesus made from water at the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, which many uh, you know, Christian drinkers use to say they can drink. I'll, I'll prove next week from the scriptures that that could not have been alcoholic wine. We'll also see that the term strong drink we read about in the Bible, occurring throughout the Bible, just in that passage I just read, uh, does not at all refer to the type of distilled liquors that we have today, like whiskey and vodka or tequila, that we think of today as strong drink. I'm talking about that. By the way, the distillation process of that kind of liquor uh, was not even invented until about the 12th century. Those didn't even exist until then. Instead, that term simply refers to fermented or alcoholic wine in its undiluted form, the drinking of which is both frowned upon and forbidden throughout the scriptures. And I'm going to show next week that neither of the two Bible verses of sipping saints and pseudo-Christian drunkards, which is 1 Timothy 5.23, take a little alcohol for your, a little wine for your stomach's sake, and Deuteronomy 14.26, you know, buy whatever your heart desires. Neither of those scriptures provide any backdoor, permission slip, or a license for Christians to consume alcoholic beverages. And for today, I'll also say point blank. And I need to say this loud and clear. I'll also show you next week in the scriptures that it is indeed sin for any Christian to openly teach and preach to others, as many pastors and self-appointed teachers across this land do, that it is okay for Christians to drink alcohol in moderation. Amen. I believe teaching that to others is a sin because those that do so cast a very heavy stumbling block before the weak Amen. in clear violation of many scriptures condemning such an evil influence. Amen. Alcohol is a raging fire. And if you play with it, you can be burned very badly. Right. Paul says in Hebrews 3.13, But exhort one another daily while it's still called today. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And there are Christians who are hardened through the deceitfulness of alcohol. Alcohol can and is indeed very deceitful. It is, in fact, one of the, I think, one of the devil's greatest deceptions. And that's why we do read in the wisdom of Proverbs that wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. So we're talking here about practical steps to conquering your sin. Step two is repent of your sin. Recognize your sin for what it is. It's a sin that God does not condone, that God will judge, and therefore must be turned from. That, in effect, is actually a definition of repentance that leads us to salvation. 
So, practical steps to conquering your sin. One, recognize you're called to holiness. Two, repent of your sin. And then three, very important, take control of your thought life. Take control of your thought life. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians 10. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, we read this already, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. They may approve it as that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. One reason we have to renew our minds on a daily basis, as Paul says here, is really because all sin begins in the mind. All sin begins in the mind. Uh, that's James' point in James chapter 1, where he says, Blessed is a man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. He says, verse 13 of James 1, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. James says, verse 14, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, and his own mind, and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, where is, where is lust conceived? In the mind. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Sin begins in the mind, where lust is. Lust is a sin of the thought life. And when we fail to take such thoughts captive, when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin brings forth death. So to conquer the sins of the flesh, we must first conquer sin in the mind. And every day, thoughts come into our mind constantly that have no business being there. Evil desires, temptations to sin, all kinds of thoughts. Some people are plagued actually just by evil thoughts. And they do nothing about it. There's something you can do about it. You have to do something about it. It's, sin starts in the mind. Paul says here in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that we are to take our thoughts captive. Verse 3, 2 Corinthians 10. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, verse 4, are not carnal, but mighty through God to pulling down strongholds. Verse 5, he says, casting down imaginations. That's, you know, evil fantasies that we may have, thoughts, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Paul says, take every thought captive, every imagination, every fantasy. He says here, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Those weapons of our warfare are described, of course, in Ephesians chapter 6. The truth of the word of God, the breastplate of righteousness, and the shield of faith, that by faith that we've all been justified by the blood of Christ. The shield of faith, that's built and strengthened, by the way, from meditating on God's word. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always in the spirit, as Paul says there. So the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to point down strongholds, including and especially strongholds in the mind. And so when I say we're to take our thoughts captive... As soon as an evil or a wicked thought or temptation comes into your mind, immediately stop what you're doing and pray. Go to prayer. Confess that very thought to the Lord Jesus. Take it captive to him. Say, I'm having this thought. Help me get this thought out of my head. Ask the Lord to help you stop having those thoughts. This works for me. I'm sure it'll work for you because we're commanded to do that. God will enable you to do it. Yes. Take your thoughts captive. And... Uh, Think thoughts about him instead. That's why the writer, by the way, says in Hebrews 12, the text for this message, lay aside every weight, verse 1. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We need to look to Jesus. And if when you're tempted, you need to just imagine the cross, and what Jesus did on the cross. But take your thoughts captive to Jesus. So we conquer our sin by one, recognizing we're called to holiness. Two, repenting of our sin. Three, taking control of our thought life. And four, very important, Talk about this all the time. Saturating ourselves in the Scriptures. Saturate yourself in the Scriptures. The primary, crucial, and essential element or weapon, the weapons of our warfare, repenting of our sin, renewing our minds daily, and taking our thoughts captive is in saturating our minds with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is critical. And we must be spending time in God's Word on a daily basis, meditating thereon day and night, as we're told, to have good success, both in Joshua 1.8 and Psalm chapter 1. Meditate thereon day and night, so that we will think God's thoughts. 
and be renewed in our minds. Take our evil thoughts captive, present them to Jesus, read God's Word, so you think God's thoughts instead of these evil thoughts. If you're not spending time in God's Word, meditating on it, meditating on it every day, you are not seeking to be holy. If you're not spending time in God's Word every day, you're not presenting your bodies a living sacrifice either. Holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And if you are not spending time in God's Word every day, you will be disarmed. You won't have the sword of spirit at your side, able, ready to use it. You'll be disabled in your struggle against sin. You won't have your the only offensive weapon in the, in the weapons of our warfare. Everything else is defensive. This is really vital and crucial in the Christian life. One of, one of the other will be true. Either God's word will keep you from sin, or you allow your sin to keep you from God's word. One of those will be true. Psalm 1, verse 1 says, Blessed, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like the tree planted by rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. we promised there. Feed your spirit, man, and take time every day to meditate on God's Word. God's Word really does have a supernatural cleansing effect. That's why Jesus said in John 15, verse 1, to his disciples, he said, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And it's also why we read in Psalm 119, verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word is how I cleanse my way. Step number five, pray without ceasing. I covered this in the message just three weeks ago in depth. But after saturating yourself in God's Word and hearing from Him first, then take time every day to spend with the Lord in prayer. Some of us let our uh, sin keep us from prayer because we convince ourselves the Lord doesn't want to hear from us in this present state. To the contrary, our sin should drive us to more prayer, to confession and seeking God's face and His deliverance. Spend time again praising Him for all the wonderful things He's done in your life and for you. Pray unceasingly for deliverance from any propensity or addiction to sin. And ask others to pray for you also. We are called to walk by faith, not by sight. Trust in the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from your sin so you can come boldly before the throne of grace like we're supposed to do. And don't ever think that prayer is pointless. Don't succumb to circumstance. Have faith in God to perform His Word. God does want to change things for us. But he wants us to ask him. That's why James says, you have not because you ask not. So if you've lost touch with God and have a weak or non-existent prayer life, that's probably one of the main reasons you're losing your battle against sin. Restore your prayer life, pray without ceasing. Number six, separate yourself from worldly people and worldly ways. Critical. Get worldly influences out of your life. Don't hang out with questionable people. Replace those influences with God, with godly people and godly influences. You listen to preaching, Christian music. You know, if you're addicted to television, that's one thing you need to repent of. Turn the television off. Proverbs 19:27 says, "Cease, my son, to hear the instruction that causes to err from the words of knowledge. Get away from that stuff." And, of course, Psalm 101, verse 3, David says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them, David says, that turn aside from God's word. It shall not cleave to me. And we just read Psalm 1, verse 1. Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. And watching TV and listening to whatever it is, Dr. Phil or Oprah or whatever it is, is walking in the counsel of the ungodly. And we are not to walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Cease to hear the instruction that causes you to err in the words of knowledge. I've said this before and I'll say it again. If you are addicted to TV, then you are constantly walking in the counsel of the ungodly. It's no wonder you can't get victory over other areas of of your life when you're constantly filling your mind with worldly thoughts and the foolishness of this world. You want victory, really, from your sin. 
Separate yourself from worldly people in worldly ways. Do as David suggests in Psalm 101, verse 2. He says, I will behave myself wisely in a perfect way. Oh, when wilt thou come unto me? I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. I'll set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person, said David. Separate from evil. And then number seven, just say no. Just say no. Remember this. We never, ever have to sin. We never sin without choosing to sin. We never have to sin. Whenever any temptation comes our way, we always have a choice to make. And God always makes a way out so that we never have to sin. We know the passage. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Some teach that this verse is about the temptations of trials and sufferings. But the context is very clear in this passage that Paul is talking here about temptation to sin. And so just read the context there, 1 Corinthians 10. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and read it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 10, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmur, talking about uh, the Israelites in the wilderness. They were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for their for examples. And they are written for our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Why? So that we won't sin like they do. He says, Wherefore let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. Into what? Into sin, like they did. Then he says, there hath no temptation taken you, such as the coming of man. So the context is about sin. And then also, look at after that, after verse 13. He says, wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. So the context here is the sin of idolatry. When thoughts of temptation come, take those thoughts captive. And if you have to shout out loud to yourself, no, then shout out loud to yourself, just say no. Let's say no. We can all lay aside the weight and the sin that does easily beset us. We should not resign ourselves to any sin whatsoever. We never have to sin. God says both in Jeremiah 3.22, He says also in Hosea 14, verse 4, I will heal your backsliding. And God knows how to do that. Peter says, 2 Peter 2.9, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust at the day of judgment to be punished. So walk by faith, not by sight. Believe God's word. Believe God can change things for you and deliver you. Why? Because he can and will deliver us out of bondage. If we'll just, as he said in Jeremiah chapter 3, acknowledge your iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord thy God and turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord. Return you backsliding children and I will heal your backslidings. Amen. Let's go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for your word. We thank, for, we thank you, Lord, for the promise of victory that we can have in Christ. We'll just turn to Jesus, the author and finish of our faith. Look to him so to help us, Lord, to, to do these things, to set aside, to lose the weight, that easily be, the weight of sin that does beset us. We all struggle with this, Lord. Help us to remember these things daily, to remind ourselves of these things, to focus on your word daily and pray and and to not allow ourselves to resign ourselves to any sin in our life. Help us to seek to be holy. In all these things we pray, and in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, amen.